So let me talk about how we go about valuing businesses. And the analogy I usually use that works with most people is, let's say you're buying a house, and they're asking a million dollars for the house, and your job is to figure out whether it's a good deal or not. Pretty straightforward. There are certain simple questions that you would ask to determine whether that's a good deal or not. One question you might ask is, you know, if I rented out this house, net of my expenses, you know, how much would I get for it? And if I could get 70 or 80, 90 thousand dollars a year net of my expenses for that million dollar house in a 3% interest rate environment, that 7 or 8 or 9% free cash flow yield on the house might indicate that it might be, you know, priced well. Uh, what's another question I might ask if I were trying to figure out if that's a good deal or not? Pretty simple question. I pretty much know what you'd ask next. What are the other houses on the block going for, the block next door and the town next door? How relatively cheap is this relative to other similar houses? And that's what we do, by the way. We say, how cheap is this company relative to other similar companies, let's say in the same industry? How cheap is this company versus all my choices as a company? How, how cheap is this being priced now on a cash flow basis relative to all my current choices? We also have another measure of relative value uh, that we look at, and we go back in history and we see how the market has traditionally valued this business versus other businesses and how it's valuing it today. Just another measure of relative value. Simple way to think about that is if a company has traditionally been premium priced, and today it's available at an average price relative to the market, uh, it's cheaper than it's traditionally been on this particular measure of relative value. It would get a good grade if a company has traditionally been bargain priced relative to the market. Today it's available at an average price, more expensive than it's traditionally been on this particular measure of relative value. It would get a bad grade from us. We would never use any measure of relative value all by itself, right? You can end up owning the cheapest internet stock at the top of a bubble. But we use our measures of absolutely cheap on a free cash flow basis. How much rent could I get for it? Relatively cheap to similar companies, relatively cheap to all companies, relatively cheap to, cheap to history, as checks and balances against each other. And I have a chart that either I turned it off or on. There it is. I only have one slide. That was not very swift. Anyway. So this is a study we did following the criteria I just laid out, valuing businesses just like you'd value a house, right? How absolutely cheap is it? How relatively cheap is it in different ways? This is a study of the, from 1992 to 2012, 20-year study. We just updated it for the last five years. Looks the same. This is a 20-year study of the 2,000 largest companies in the U.S., where we value them from 1 to 2,000 along the lines that I just told you with those measures of absolute and relative value. The x-axis is the valuation percentile. All this means is if you were in the bottom left-hand corner over there, in the first percentile, you would be the 20 companies that measure cheapest according to those measures of absolute and relative value that I just discussed. Out of the 2,000 largest, you're the 20 cheapest. You're in the first percentile. Now, the values of businesses don't change daily, but prices do. So we re-rank daily, and that 1% is continually updated. If you fell in the 99th percentile, that would mean that you were the 20 companies at any particular time that measured most expensive out of the 2,000 largest in the United States. Pretty straightforward. More important is the y-axis. The y-axis is the year forward return on average for stocks in each percentile. So what this chart literally says is if you fell in the first percentile, those stocks in the first percentile averaged a one year forward return of 38% over the next year. Remember, the stocks are constantly updated. Stocks that fell in our second percentile, owning the second percentile stocks, average a one-year forward return of 37%. Then we drop down to the best fit line, which I always say I don't mind missing when we're making extra money. And as we measure something more expensive and the percentile drops, the year forward return drops, and it's pretty linear. And if we had missed so badly in percentile one and two, and I move those down to the best fit line, that fits about 0.9%. So if you were sitting in my class at Columbia, and I said, does anyone see a long short strategy that you might pursue if you could predict ahead of time which stocks would do best, second best, third best, in order? And you did not say, I guess I'd buy a bunch of stocks up here, 
and short a bunch of stocks down here. If you didn't say that, I would have to throw you out of class because it's pretty straightforward. That's what you should do. And by the way, that's what we do. So this is a bunch of uh, professional analysts. And if you're a professional analyst, you would look at that chart and say, something's very, very wrong. That's way too good, 0.9%. Uh, and by the way, all the metrics I gave you about absolutely cheap, relatively cheap, everything else, backward looking. No predictions involved. Got a 90% fit. So why, if it's so simple, and I just laid it out for you, uh, is it so hard to do? Well, the answer is that this is an average over 20 years. If what we did and if we did it this way, and it looked like this every day and every month and every year, and it worked in order like this, everyone would do this. Uh, it doesn't look like this. When you're living through it, it's quite noisy. If I gave you a two or three year snippet within those 20 years, the fit would be nice. It would kind of rhyme a little bit with this, but it would be like 0 0.55, 0 0.6. It wouldn't be 0.9, right? It doesn't work every day and every month and every year. Uh, but what this chart would tell me is, as opposed to momentum or low price book investing or who knows you know, whether it will continue to work. You know, the way you would value a house, the way you would value any earning asset, we can't value Bitcoin, okay, uh, or gold for that matter. But if we have an earning asset or an asset that we expect to have earnings, uh, we can uh, perhaps uh, value it and those very simple measures uh, are approximately how the market values those companies over time especially if you buy a bucket of them. <laughs> uh, you'll be right on average. And if it's not working in the short term, should we stick to our guns? This chart would say yes. Okay, we have to balance our risks. We have to do a lot of things. Uh, but we should stick to our guns. Valuation is like gravity, is, is the best way I would put it. So, you know, I have a friend who's an orthopedic surgeon, and I, he's head of this group of orthopedic surgeons, and they have a big dinner every year, and you know, for whatever reasons, he asked me to give a talk about investing uh, for about a half an hour to the learned doctors in the room and take some questions, so I gave, explained how the stock market worked for about a half an hour, and then I said, you know, any questions? First question was, the uh, market was down 2% yesterday, should I get out? <laughs> the second question was, uh, oil was up 1% yesterday, should I get in? My conclusion from those questions uh, was that I had just crashed and burned, and they didn't understand anything I had just said about <laughs> the stock market. And I don't know about luckily, but a few days later, I got asked to teach a ninth grade class, all the kids were from Harlem, uh, an investing class, once a week for an hour, teach them about investing. And you know, these doctors had a lot of degrees and they had to be really smart to get there. They were all surgeons and you know, pretty successful guys and women. But now I was asked to teach ninth graders who had no money or interest or background and no degrees yet. And I had failed with the doctors. So I said yes anyway. And I thought I had a few weeks to prepare for the first class and I didn't want to fail with the kids. So I thought about it and I walked in the first day of class with a big jar of jelly beans in one of those old time glass jars. And I passed the jar of jelly beans around the room and I passed out three by five cards. And I told the kids to count the rows, do whatever they had to do, Write down how many jelly beans do you think are in the jar. And so they passed the jelly beans around, they did their counting or whatever they were going to do, they wrote down, I collected the three by five cards. Then I went one by one around the room and I said, tell me how many jelly beans do you think are in the jar and you can keep your original guess, you can change your guess, that's completely up to you. And I went one by one around the room and said how many jelly beans are in the jar and I wrote down those answers. So here are the results of that test. When I averaged the guesses from the three by five cards, the average guess was 1,771 jelly beans, and there were 1,776 
jelly beans in the jar. So that was pretty good. When I went around the room one by one and asked them, that guess averaged to 850 jelly beans. And I told the kids that the stock market was actually the second guess. OK, because everyone knows what they just heard, what they just watched, what they just read, who they just talked to. They're influenced by everything around them. And they didn't make a very good guess. When they were cold and calculating and independent, okay, their guess turned out to be much better. So I think of ourselves as cold-hearted jelly bean counters when we're trying to value businesses and trying to you know, cover our ears and close our eyes and uh, try to uh, figure out valuation without being influenced by things around us. One of the ways to do that is to use trailing numbers <laughs> rather than our own projections turns out to work better.